There we go. We are now being recorded. So welcome everybody. And um, you, so if you have a question, you have the opportunity to either use the Q&A box or the chat field. The Q&A box should be in your menu. Uh, you should have a menu like towards the bottom and you should see a little option that says Q&A. That helps to keep the questions nice and organized for me and it makes it real easy for me to find them. If you put them in the chat, I can still see them probably. Sometimes the chat scrolls really fast and I miss questions that way. So if you really wanna make sure that I get your question answered, please do use that Q&A field. Um, for your safety, you should only be able to see what I post in the chat, but just in case I missed a sitting uh, setting, please don't click on any links other than what I might post in the chat. Um, and I'm actually gonna go ahead and post a couple of links for you right now. The first one is our brochure that we have um, on our native landscaping. This is my absolute favorite brochure that we put out affectionately referred to as the yellow brochure. It is full of native plants and landscaping tips and it tells you all about the plants and the water they require, the sunlight or shade that they require, whether they're good for birds, butterflies, wildlife. It's a fabulous brochure. I give it out to everybody that I can because it is really a ton of really useful information in there. I consult it all the time. Whenever I do a conservation at home visit, I consult that. Um, I'm also going to put another link here to our website. And this is the native garden section of our website. So if you are interested in creating native garden and you're looking for more information and after this webinar, you just want to dive into more stuff, feel free to take a look at our website there because we've got lots of really good information on there too. Rain gardens, rain barrels, lots of information that you might like there. So, yes. I am Jamie Vebach. I am the Will County Director of the Conservation Foundation. So again, I am, wanna welcome everybody here today. And with that, um, oh, a couple more housekeeping things for TCF. Um, normally this time of year, we would be preparing for our benefit dinner. It's one of our biggest fundraisers of the year uh, with everything going on and everybody stuck at home. Uh, we have moved our benefit dinner virtually. So starting on Wednesday, you can participate in our online silent auction. So, so you can see our website for more details on that. And then also our native plant and veggie plant sale has been changed to online ordering with contactless pickup. So you'll be able to place orders May 1st through 3rd online and then be able to pick them up. It'll just be sort of a drive up. You give them your name, they'll load them in your trunk on May 8th and 9th. So please do check that out. If you're looking for a place to get your native plants, that's where I would go. So without further ado, welcome again to all 42 of you. I am gonna go ahead and share my screen and we're gonna start talking some butterflies here. All right. Come on. There we go. So yes, we're talking about creating pollinator gardens today. And I am Jamie Vibach, again, the Will County Director with the Conservation Foundation. And those of you who aren't familiar with the Conservation Foundation, who are we? Well, we are a nonprofit. Our focus is protecting the health of our communities. And we do that by preserving and restoring natural areas, working in watersheds, working with landowners, and we just wanna protect our land and our waterways. And we are an accredited land trust, um, which probably doesn't mean a whole lot to most of you, but trust me when I say it's a really, really big deal. So this is where we work. Each of those dots on the map there represents a piece of property that we have helped to pre preserve somehow. So we work with municipalities, landowners, forest preserves, park districts, you name it, we've probably worked with them. So we have nearly 200 parcels on there with 43 conservation easements in seven counties. The core four counties we work in are Kane, Kendall, DuPage, and Will. But we'll basically work with anybody who needs help. So um, if you're outside of our core four conservation area, welcome and you are more than welcome to talk with us. And if we can't help you, we probably have friends who can. So 
um, that's a little bit who we are. And why are we interested in conserving open space? Well, we want to preserve our quality of life. Preserves our water quality, drinking water. I mean, we all know we need healthy land, healthy water to make healthy people. Preserving wildlife habitat so we have places to go outside, see the animals and the plants, um, and protecting those animals and plants as well. That's good for kids, you know, especially now, those of you who have kids, you see them cooped up inside all the time. They just, they need to get outside and run around and play. Um, it just, it helps them to be healthy, both physically and mentally. And it's part of our responsibility to future generations to take care of all of this so that they can enjoy it as well. So let's talk about first the components of a butterfly garden. So there's two types of plants that butterflies care about, host plants and nectaring plants. Host plants are what the plants that butterflies lay their eggs on. So it's the things that the caterpillars are going to eat. Some butterflies are hugely specific, maybe just one plant, one family of plants. Others can be a little bit more generalized, but some are very, very specific. One of the most popular examples right now, anybody who wants to, to promote butterflies, promote uh, monarch butterflies know that you need members of the Asclepius family, the milkweeds, so that because that's all that they'll lay their eggs on. Very fascinating reasons why, but um, those are what they will lay their eggs on, and that's it. So they need to have milkweed plants to lay their eggs. So if you plant milkweeds in your yard, you have a much better chance of bringing those monarchs in. Nectaring plants, on the other hand, are what the adults feed on. So those are the ones with the big bright flowers, that the adults can get their nectar from. So you wanna make sure you have both of these types of plants so that you support these butterflies throughout their life cycles. So there, let's talk a minute about their life cycle. First of all, they start with an egg. So you can see at the tip of the pencil there, that little cream colored dot, that is a butterfly egg. This in particular one is a monarch egg and monarch eggs are sort of cream colored, football shaped and Yes, they are about the size of a head of a pin. Um, I have raised them indoors. I go looking for the eggs and they are not easy to find. So then they hatch out of that egg into the caterpillar. And the caterpillar, again, if we're talking monarchs specifically, just for ease, um, monarchs spend about two or three days inside the egg and then they hatch out and then they're gonna spend about two weeks as a caterpillar. And the caterpillar's only job is to eat. It eats and eats and poops and eats and poops and eats and poops. And that is all it does for two whole weeks. After those two weeks, it's going to make a chrysalis. That chrysalis then is where the butterfly, basically the body just turns to goo inside there. And it's, it's very fascinating how all of this happens. Um, and we really haven't understood it that well um, until very recently, they've been able to use MRI machines to look inside that chrysalis and see kind of what's going on in there. Really very interesting. Some of the organs, the heart um, analog that's, that the caterpillar has, that sort of stays intact. Um, the gold flecks that you see on the chrysalis on the outside, those are spiracles, effectively how the, the caterpillar does gas transfer, how it breathes. Um, those kind of stay intact. Um, but basically everything else just turns into this soup inside. And then that soup somehow comes together and out comes that butterfly. So it's going to take, as I said, about two or three days inside the egg, two weeks as a caterpillar, two weeks as a chrysalis. Then it's going to come out of that chrysalis and it's going to spend about two weeks as an adult. Now, again, speaking specifically about monarchs, that's true for the four generations that live here for their whole life. However, monarchs are really fascinating in that they migrate. So that fifth generation, they call it the super generation. That last generation that's here in the fall, um, usually around September, end of September, October-ish, um, that last generation, it's kind of like they become a teenager and then they stop, they stop growing you know, they stop aging. So their development, everything just freezes. And it does that so that they can fly from here, the Chicago area, all the way down to Mexico. They make this huge journey 
that one individual is going to fly from here all the way down to Mexico. And then it's going to spend about three months hanging out in the Oyamel trees um, in the, these forests outside of um, Mexico City and around there. And so they're going to be hanging out in these trees for about three months. And then come about February, March, as things start to warm up, they're going to start the journey back. They're going to get to about Texas. And that's when they're going to, their development's going to start up again. They're going to lay eggs and that butterfly is going to die. Those eggs then are going to hatch, turn into caterpillars, turn into butterflies. They're going to continue that journey and they're going to make it to maybe Missouri-ish. And then they're going to lay eggs and die. Those eggs are going to grow up. And then finally, that it's either like three to four generations are gonna, it's gonna take to get them back here. So these butterflies have never been here before. Their parents have never been here before. It's possible their grandparents were not even here. They're gonna make it all the way back up here and they're gonna start that cycle again. It's really a fascinating, fascinating life cycle that they have. So most of, of the butterflies that are here are gonna live for about two weeks except for that big super generation. So other things to think about for your butterfly garden is you wanna have some dark colored rocks. They use those rocks to warm up on the cool mornings. So because they are not warm blooded like we are, they need to absorb some heat from their surroundings. So by having some dark colored rocks in there, it gives them a place to sort of hang out and warm up in the mornings. So in addition to that, they also wanna have sunny spots. So those sunny areas, generally you can fill them with lots of sun-loving flowers. And that again, gives them places to be warm and to hang out and sort of just do their butterfly thing. They also need water. However, they gotta be very careful not to drown. So you wanna have very shallow pools of water with rocks in it that they can rest on to drink from. So you can see the bird bath that's down there, that's got a really nice setup there with some sand in it that they can hang out in. That sand will also provide some minerals that they need, as well as rocks for them just to sort of hang out on, take a drink as they need it. And then some shelter. Obviously, you don't need to create that large of a shelter just for the butterflies, but having some kind of sheltered areas for them when it gets really hot during the day, and you know those hot July days or um, whatever, that gives them an area that they can hang out and cool off as they need to. So we talk a lot about native plants. And so why do we want to use native plants? Well, there's a couple of reasons. For one, it saves you time and money. They found that native plants compared to typical ornamental plantings will save you 50 to 60% um, in both time and money because native plants are used to being here. We don't have to spend as much time babying them and uh, fertilizing them and watering them and taking care of them because they're used to being here. They're totally fine on their own. It also helps to replenish our water table. For those of you on a well like me, you know that we're dependent on that underground source of water. Well, rain falling on, um, falling on the ground we want it to go into the ground rather than trying to collect it up and send it off to the nearest rivers and streams. So to do that, using things like a rain garden, rain barrels, having lots of native plants that have long roots that will help the water to come down into the soil rather than just cascading off the surface and going right into the nearest waterway, that helps to refill that water table. And also it's what our birds and our butterflies know. So these are the plants that they're familiar with. These are the ones they look at it and say, yes, I know this is food. My mouth part is adapted to be able to take nectar out of that flower. Um, and then for the birds, by supporting the butterflies, birds love caterpillars. That's one of their biggest food sources for the baby birds when they're trying to feed their babies are caterpillars. They are just like little hot dogs full of nutrients and the good things that the babies like to eat. So um, by feeding the butterflies and the other pollinators, you're also providing food for the birds as well. So it helps to bring them to your yard as well. I love this graphic. Um, it shows the, really shows the difference in root structure between 
our native plants versus the non-native species that frequently get planted. So if you look at the Kentucky bluegrass, for example, this guy right here, you can see the roots are only about two to three inches deep. As opposed to the buffalo grass, buffalo grass is a native type of grass that grows here. It looks almost identical to Kentucky bluegrass. It only grows about 18 inches tall ever. So you can actually get away with mowing it about twice a year. It, so if you were to swap your, uh, your normal lawn with buffalo grass, you wouldn't have to mow every week like you do in the summer here. In addition, it stays green all summer long because check out those roots, right? Going that deep, two and a half meters deep, um, allows them to continue to get water even when those top two to three inches have dried out. Same with the prairie drop seed and black-eyed Susans. Planting black-eyed Susans instead of daylilies means they're going to continue to grow and look good all summer long and you know you don't have to worry about fertilizing them or doing anything like that because they're taking care of themselves. So one of my absolute favorite animals, I just find them so fascinating. Um, but we mentioned that members of the Asclepius family are what they need to lay their eggs on, so those milkweeds. So here we've got a couple of different examples of milkweeds here. Um, you can see this is what the caterpillar looks like. It's got that sort of yellow and black and white stripes on it. Then on the top right, you can see that's a common milkweed. So common milkweed is kind of a tricky one to plant in your yard. I, I generally don't advise it for front yards because it can get to be almost six feet tall um, and it can look a little bit weedy, but it's perfect for a backyard. Those flower heads are gorgeous. They smell like perfume. They're really pretty wonderful. Uh, and then going across the bottom, um, on the bottom left, we have swamp milkweed. Swamp milkweed grows to about waist high, so not quite as tall as that common milkweed. Um, and despite the name, swamp milkweed can be planted in drier areas as well. It does need a little bit of moisture, so you don't want to put it in a super dry area, but it doesn't have to, you know, be swampy, have standing water uh, for it to do well. Um, in the middle, um, I believe that's a world milkweed. That's another really pretty one. Um, and then butterfly weed is another really common one too. That one really only grows to about knee height, so it's perfect for front yard plantings. It's got bright orange flowers on it, so those are very striking um, and, and very eye-catching for um, a front landscape bed. So then we have uh, black swallowtails as well. This is another type of native butterfly that's here. Absolutely gorgeous. You can see what their caterpillars look like, sort of that um, green with black and yellow stripes on them. Um, they like members of the carrot family. So dill, golden alexanders, um, Queen Anne's lace. I don't really advise Queen Anne's lace for plant native plantings because they do get a little bit out of control. They are kind of weedy, but it is what the black swallowtail will eat. So um, if you plant carrots in your garden or dill or fennel, any of those, um, any members of those families, they absolutely love them. Pearl crescents. These are really pretty little butterflies, um, maybe a little bit less common. Um, but their host plant is asters. So they love those aster plants. Um, we've got sky blue asters down there at the bottom, New England asters. Um, and asters are really great plants to have in your garden because they bloom in the fall. So they are also one of those last food sources that as those monarchs are passing through on their migration, they still, they need lots and lots of food. So having these fall blooming plants make sure that they have something to eat in the fall as well. So, and it also helps to keep some color going in your garden up through, I mean, these things are blooming in October still. So um, they, they help to keep some color in your garden all throughout the year. Eastern tiger swallowtail, this is another really pretty big guy. Um, their caterpillars look really funny. They've got those um, big false eyes on their back. So those are really cool. And I wanted to include them here because they actually, um, their host plants are trees. So they like maple and apple and cherry. And so not, we normally think of 
forbs, the non-woody plants as being host plants for these pollinators, but a lot of times trees are as well. Oak trees, I, I mean, oak trees, I want to say it's somewhere in the neighborhood of like 750 species of insects will use oak trees as their host. So keep that in mind with your landscaping too, that providing native trees also makes for a nice home for these guys as well. Having a butterfly garden means less mowing. It means that you'll be able to have more of your yard in flower and, and not have to mow it and water it and take care of it like that. So this is an example from a park district. They had had a, this little triangle here and they would have to actually bring the mower out just to mow that little triangle every week. So instead, we recommended that they put a, a pollinator garden there. And so you can see we've got lots of cone flowers in there and other plants, that nice, looks like maybe a maple tree. I can't quite tell what that is in there. Um, but now they don't have to mow it. And so that actually ended up saving them money by putting that little garden in there. Now, I'm not suggesting that you go out and turn your backyard into a full prairie. As cool as that would be, not everybody's got the funds or the homeowners association to allow them to do that. So all it takes is just replacing some of your existing landscaping with some native plants. So for example, we mentioned the daylilies. You can take the daylilies out and replace them with some butterfly milkweed. Add in some of that blazing star up there in the middle or some coreopsis, right? All of those are really, really gorgeous plants. Uh, the bottom right, that's a baptisia. That's another really, really pretty one. Uh, yarrow is another great one for butterflies. That's the top right. And cardinal flower is also another favorite one there too on the bottom left. If nothing else, you can add these. So we already mentioned the milkweeds and the asters as being the host plants and the oaks. Black-eyed Susans, goldenrods. Be careful with the goldenrods. Some of them do get a little bit weedy. There are some that are good for your yard though. Something like, uh, like an elm-leafed goldenrod is nice. Um, but these five genus will support three quarters of all of our native insects here in the Chicago region. So just by having those plants there, you are supporting all of these native pollinators. So this is, this is a really good place to start. And in addition, you've got things that are blooming all year long. So one of the questions I get asked about pollinator gardens is people will say, you know, I don't want to put a pollinator garden in because I'm allergic to bees or schools will say, oh, we've got kids who are allergic to bees and, and bee stings, so we can't put pollinator gardens in. Well, I'm here to say you don't have to worry. Our native pollinators are not the ones that are generally going to be stinging you. You really have to try to get stung by one of these guys. Um, they are generally... Um, they're, they're really just too busy. To worry about you. So they're busy collecting their pollen and collecting their nectar. They don't really care what you're doing. I mean, you really have to go and like grab it or step on it. And I really just don't advise that. Um, some of them, like the carpenter bee there in the lower right, they don't even have stingers. Come on. There we go. All right, so you can see here the difference between a honeybee and a yellow jacket. Now, honeybees are not native either. Honeybees are an introduced species. Um, they came from Europe. Most of the honeybees that beekeepers around here use are from Italy. They're Italian honeybees. Um, they are effectively livestock, which is kind of weird to think about because you think about them being just a pollinator or they're an insect. But just like cattle and sheep and, and pigs, they are effectively livestock. They're introduced animals that, that we use to provide goods for us. But there are between four and 5,000 native species of bees that you're supporting by planting these plants as well. They are herbivores. They're the ones that are going after the pollen and the nectar on the plants. Their stingers are like a, a uh, fish hook. So they have a barb on the end. So when they sting you, 
as they go to fly away, it actually rips off part of their abdomen. It's going to kill them. They know this. They don't want to sting if they don't have to. Yellow jackets, on the other hand, are a type of wasp. They are carnivores. They're going after meat. They're going after other insects and other things. They really don't care about your flowers. Their stingers are more like hypodermic needles, so they can sting over and over and over again and fly away laughing. I'm, I'm sure they do. I, I swear I've heard it. Um, but they don't care about your native flowers because they're not uh, they're not going after the nectar and the pollen. They're the ones that are going to be going after your can of pop or your bologna sandwich or whatever it is that, that you know, your chips and your food that you have out. These are the ones that are always hanging around garbage cans, right? They don't care about your native plants. It's not, that's not going to attract them. So you don't have to worry by putting in a pollinator garden. It does not increase your chances of being stung. So, we have, through the Conservation Foundation, created this program called Conservation at Home. We have, say, almost a thousand certified properties. I'm going to guess we're over a thousand at this point. I haven't checked the latest numbers yet, but I know we were close. Um, but through the Conservation at Home program, that allows us to come out and visit your yard with you and walk around, talk about native plants, talk about um, what plants you could put where, make recommendations on rain gardens and rain barrels. And then um, afterwards, if, once you have your native plants put in, you're doing something with your storm water, your yard can be certified. And then you get that nice little sign that you see there that tells all your neighbors, hey, I know what I'm doing. And I did all this on purpose and hopefully start some good conversations with them as well. So, once we are out of this um, little lockdown that we've got going on now, um, you can give me a call. And if you are in Will County, I will come out. If you are not in Will County, um, drop me a line anyway, and, and I can hook you up with somebody, um, whoever is in charge of that county. So there's a couple different philosophies on gardens. Um, I call this one native but neat. So this is just like any flower bed you would see in any suburban subdivision. Um, you know, you've got your clusters of plants together. They're growing in a controlled area with a nice edging on them, mulched in. This would be acceptable, I think, to just about any homeowners association out there. You've got a little native tree there in the middle. Um, I think it's a filbert. I forget exactly, but it's a very cool little native tree, uh, nut tree right there. It's not going to get super big, but it's happy where it is. And then we've got our butterfly weed here that we talked about for our monarch butterflies. And then this little guy here is called wine cups. Um, I think it's in the poppy family, if I remember correctly. Um, it's not a common one that you come across, but it's really, really pretty. And then you also have this sort of wild and free look. So your landscaping is a reflection of your personality. I like them both. Um, I like the front yard to be that native but neat, but in the backyard, I think it's really cool to get this sort of more prairie look going. You've got lots of different plants in there, all supporting one another, all kind of competing with one another so that it, they sort of help to keep their populations in check. Um, you've got the grasses filling in, uh, as well as lots of different flowers and different things blooming all the time. So just different philosophies people have on their gardens. So th this, I like showing the difference here. So this is a library, I think it was Aurora, and they remodeled, they put in this big glass rotunda there and they put chairs in front of it and they couldn't figure out why nobody wanted to sit in these chairs. So we consulted with them and, oops, no, forward, there we go. And then it turned into this. How cool does that look? So now with all these plants and all this interest going on there, they've got a bird feeder. You know, I guarantee you this is just teeming with different butterflies and birds, um, probably some squirrels and chipmunks and things as well. They can't keep people out of those chairs now. There's almost a line to wait. So this, is just an example of how putting in native plants really just improve this whole area. So 
as I said, we are the Conservation Foundation. If you are looking to get involved with us, you can become a member. As a nonprofit, we are a membership-based organization. We are supported by our members and our donors. So if you'd like to become a member or if you'd like to donate, you can visit our website. There's a great big become a member button, I think, or a donate button. Um, both will take you to the same place. And you can, by becoming a member, you'll get our newsletters, our e-newsletters. You'll find out about other uh, webinars like this that we're going to be doing. Um, you can also visit our McDonald Farm in Naperville or, or the Dixon Merced Farm in Montgomery. Our farm in Naperville is a 60 acre farm. I'm guessing it's probably the last 60 acre farm left in Naperville. Um, it has examples of windmills, solar panels, green roofs, prairie, uh, wetland restoration, all kinds of great stuff. Um, pollinator gardens, rain gardens, all that. Um, and in addition, it's also an organic farm. So you can become a shareholder in our farm, um, which means you pay us early on, like now, and all summer long, you get to pick up shares of the produce that are grown there. You can also follow us on social media. Again, especially if you're interested in more webinars like this, we'll be posting everything on our social media. So go ahead and follow us on Facebook um, or Instagram, I think we're also on, and YouTube. And yeah, our social media folks are doing a really great job on there. And then you can also get your yard certified. So go ahead and drop me an email. It's probably the easiest way to do it. And we can talk. I've been doing um, consultations over the phone right now, especially since there are plant sales going on and people want to get ideas. So I'm happy to do a consultation over the phone right now. Um, and then later on coming out to your yard and doing a yard visit that way. Um, all right, so with that, I'm gonna move over to the Q&A section here, we've got a couple of questions. So I'm going to go ahead and leave my information up on the screen there for a minute. Um, all right, so uh, can we get a copy of the slides? Yes, I can. Um, this is because this is recording, I can um, share the link where the recording is kept. And so I will pass that over to our people who run our newsletter and they can uh, include a link to this once we're all done. Um, what else? Let's see. The links, hopefully, Bridget, did you see the links I posted in the chat? I had posted, um, I shared, a, oh, you know what? I just realized I think I shared it wrong. I will share them again. Thank you for letting me know I, I did that wrong. Um, plants that might thrive in pots or planters. Um, with native plants, it can be a little bit tricky because they do have those long roots, but I think butterfly weed would do fine in a pot. Um, cone flowers I've seen in planters and in smaller areas. Um, cone flowers and black-eyed Susans tend to be pretty easy to grow. They look good together. Um, so those might, um, those might go well uh, also, um, let's see, putting in a rain garden, what natives would work? Oh, great. Um, so there are lots of really great rain garden plants. Um, let me, let's see, I'm going to stop sharing here. I have a link for, uh, here, I'm going to Post the, uh, let's see, wait here. This is the link I'm gonna post again. Um, all right, so I just posted a link in the chat. That's our creating native gardens. There's information there about rain gardens as well as uh, pollinator gardens. And then I'm also going to reshare the nature in your yard brochure. Bear with me just a second. There we go. All right, so the second list, uh, the second link I just posted is the, um, the yellow brochure. So you should be seeing that one in there now as well. 
Um, how much sunlight do these native species need? I thought prairie plants need almost full sunshine all day. Great question. It depends on the plant. So there are plenty of natives that grow in full shade. So something like um, wild geranium, wild ginger, uh, Virginia bluebells, all those guys like shade or dappled sunlight. Um, sedges work well in shady areas as well. So it really all depends on the plant. If you check out that yellow brochure, that second link that I posted there, the native landscaping brochure, um, that lists what plants need what amount of sun versus shade. If you think about the last time you went walking in the woods, the, the floor of the woods, despite how shady it is, it's not empty. There are still plants that are growing in there. So some plants do need full sun. Um, so a lot of the taller open prairie stuff does. Others can handle moderate shade as well. So um, it really all depends on the plant. Um, best sources of plant material? Great question. Um, so my favorite, I live outside of Joliet and the closest native plant nursery to me is Possibility Place. Um, if you give them a call, they really know their stuff down there. They've got really good plants and Kelsey or Terry, anybody down there can give you um, some really great suggestions on plants for whatever type of area that you're looking for. So um, out, outside of, they're in Moni, so pretty far south for a, a lot of folks. Um, natural area natives is another one. Midwest ground cover is another one. Um, I know there are more. Um, if you're looking for, um, you can also order online someplace like um, Prairie Nursery or Prairie Moon Nursery. Both of those do um, online ordering. So you can order from them as well. Um, I've ordered from them and they're, they're very good. Um, good native shrubs. Oh, there's all kinds of good native shrubs. Um, it, a lot depends on what your area is like. Um, dogwoods and viburnum are gorgeous native shrubs. Um, spice bush, witch hazel, all of those are really nice as well. Um, if you want something that gets a little bit taller, uh, an elderberry, those are really good too. Um, yeah, lots of really great native shrubs. Um, in that yellow brochure, there's a whole list of um, the, it's, it's, that yellow brochure is divided out by height. So the very first A group, those are gonna be your super tall trees. Your B group's gonna be um, real tall shrubs and your understory trees. C group gets to be a little bit shorter shrubs and your taller forbs. So in that brochure, there, there's a whole list in there and you can match that to how wet the area is and how much sunlight it gets. Um, I get little red bugs on my milkweed, lots of them. If I plant milkweed by my veggie garden, will they eat my vegetables? Um, so the red bugs that you're talking about on there are called milkweed beetles. They will not eat your vegetables. They are generally pretty specific to milkweed plants. So, um, Milkweeds also sometimes are prone to aphids. Those are those little bitty orange ones that you get on there too. But again, I don't think they would hurt your vegetables. Um, I, I, I think they would be fine. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so for mail order, um, again, Prairie Nursery, Prairie Moon Nursery are both great um, mail order nurseries. I think Possibility Place is going to be soon opening mail order. I know they're working on it. I, I'm not sure if they've got it open yet. Um, native woodland plants that attract pollinators. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, yeah, so native woodland plants that attract pollinators. Um, Virginia bluebells, if you can get them to grow, they're great for pollinators. Um, geraniums, the wild geraniums are also good for that. Um, I think swamp milkweed will grow in um, less shade as well. Um, what else is good for woodland? I'm trying to think of 
my shady plants that are in there. Um, those are the ones that spring to mind immediately. While I love wild ginger, I'm not sure what pollinators go for that one because it's got kind of that hidden flower on it that's really cool. Um, so yeah, so those those are a few there that, that are good. Um, please advise your audience if the TCF brochures are available for online viewing. Yes, the TCF brochures are available for online viewing. Um, you can find them at the links that I posted. One was specifically for our landscaping brochure. The first link that I posted will take you to our website and you can get links to our brochures off of um, that section of our website as well. Is it okay to plant milkweed near a tree if it still has access to sunlight? Yes. Um, I, I don't think milk, some types of milkweed are not that particular. So something like swamp milkweed I think is fine in partial shade. Um, butterfly milkweed I think likes it sunnier. So it depends on what direction and, and um, how tall your tree is. So, um, yeah. If you have aphids attack your milkweed, how can you deal with them while not harming any butterfly eggs? Great question. That is a big one. Um, so the best way that I've seen, um, I have seen people clip off the sections that ha are real heavy with aphids and just get rid of them you can sort of squish by hand. Um, the, the problem with any kind of chemical treatment, no matter if it's organic or not, um, is the purpose of an insecticide is to kill insects. So whether it's an organic insecticide or a conventional insecticide, its goal is to kill insects. So I don't care how natural it is, whatever, it's going to kill. So mechanical means are generally preferred if you're trying to protect um, your butterfly uh, eggs or your caterpillar eggs. So if you can, you know, wipe them off, maybe take a, a, like a damp paper towel or something and just sort of wipe them off, um, you know, hand squish them, clip off if they're just on the tip or something, you can clip off that tip and get rid of it. That'll help to protect your plant as well. Hope that answered your question. Um, let me see, make sure I answered them all. Answered that one. All right, and let's see, moving to questions in the chat. Um, that. What months should I put native seeds into prairie or woods? Um, so that's going to depend on the plants themselves. So milkweeds are really interesting in that they have to go through a freeze and thaw cycle in order to grow. Now, you can approximate that in your home refrigerator, but um, if you're just looking to throw some seeds out there, the best time for milkweeds anyway is to put them out in the fall or even in the middle of winter. You can sow them like right into the snow and cover them up. Um, and then that freeze-thaw cycle breaks open the seed coat so that the, the uh, plant can sprout. Others, if you're trying to plant um, just like um, plugs or something like that, spring is good. Um, you know, you can put them in really just about any time and they'll be fine. Um, Generally, I start to plant stuff in April and May, um, but it, seeds, I mean, even now would be fine for a lot of them. A, a lot just depends on what it takes for those seeds to germinate. Like I said, some are like milkweed that need to go through a freeze-thaw cycle. Some you can put down now and they'll be good. Um, are there natives that will help control or get rid of garlic mustard? I don't know of any. Um, basically, the best thing you can do with garlic mustard is just to get it out of there. Uh, make sure it doesn't set seed and try and crowd it out. 
with other things. The problem with garlic mustard is because it comes up so early, it, it tends to get out in front of everything else. So if you're trying to control garlic mustard, just getting it out of there and um, I pull it, I've heard now they're saying maybe pulling's not the best because you disturb the soil. Um, I have a little bit of it in my yard and I've been able to successfully control it that way. If you've got a larger area, you might need to treat it with an herbicide. Um, but I don't know of any plants that control or get rid of garlic mustard. Um, okay. Let's see, anything else? Yeah, thanks, Bridget. The, um, there is, oh, it's not going to let me copy that. Um, the TCF plant sale order form for the trees is there. Um, it's, it's, on, it's live right now. So if you go to our website, you can find it there. Um, the order form for all the plants, it says, will be live May 1st. Recommendations for removing slash killing turf grass. Um, hmm. I have not done a lot of that myself. So a lot of times you, you can go a couple of different routes depending on what the rest of the area is like, how big of an area you're trying to get rid of. If it's just a small area, um, I've had luck putting down black plastic over it, um, weighting it down with some rocks and things and letting that kill it off. Um, you can also do kind of a one-time spray of Roundup, something along those lines, um, and, and kill it. I know we don't like to use herbicides. We want to use them as little as possible, but sometimes in cases like that, that really is just the best way to get rid of it so we can get our native stuff in and, and do our good stuff later. Um, so like I said, those, those are kind of the, the two different routes that I would go um, trying to remove turf grass. Um, all right, well, I hope I answered everyone's questions. If not, I'm gonna go ahead, I, I will share my screen again here so you can see my contact information. Um, feel free to drop me an email anytime. Um, my phone number is there, but that is my office line. So obviously I'm not in the office, I'm working from home right now, um, but feel free to drop me an email. And if I can't help you, generally I can at least find someone who can. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and sign off. Thank you all for watching. Thanks for joining us. Um, and good luck with your pollinator garden. Let us know how it goes. And we hope to see you on a future webinar. Thank you.